Greetings and welcome to this special IMCCA webcast, this time being sponsored by my colleagues and friends at Poly, um, talking about what's going on during the pandemic that we're dealing with from an end user perspective. We have enterprise technology managers on with us, and we're going to really ask them, how are they coping with this sudden remote workforce and, and, and these environments that we never really expected to be in? Um, also different this time is I have a co-host. Uh, why don't you uh, introduce yourself, Stephanie, and tell everybody who you are and what you do? Yeah, thank you, David. My name is Stephanie Atkinson. I'm the CEO of Compass Intelligence. We are a market research and advisory firm, and primarily focusing on enterprise mobility, Internet of Things, and emerging technologies. So I'm glad to be here today, and um, I welcome the discussion. Thank you, Stephanie. So I'm going to just break from my normal pattern here for a second and put up a quick gallery view of everybody that's on the call so you can get a sense if you guys want to wave and smile and uh, and be happy with everything. <laughs> so so uh, uh, this is who we're talking to today, and I'm, I'm going to ask each one of them to introduce themselves in the order that we have uh, on, on the listing here on my panel, which actually then starts with Pete. So Pete, why don't you say hello and tell everybody what you do. Hi, I'm Pete Kolak. I'm with Intuit, and uh, I'm responsible for all the conference rooms globally around the world. Thank you, Pete. Um, next on my list is Nancy. Can you introduce yourself and tell everybody what you do? Sure. Um, my name is Nancy Trefney. I'm a project manager at Morgan Stanley in the multimedia group. Thank you, Nancy. Mike Duda, say hi and tell everybody what you do. Hey, everybody. It's Michael Duda. Um, I'm at Google. I'm a program manager there. Thank you, Michael. Mark? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Brown. I work for Swiss Re. I'm responsible for multimedia projects and engineering in the Americas region. Thank you, Mark. Next on my list is Kimberly. Hi, everybody. I'm Kimberly Day. I'm Senior Director of IT Employee Enablement at Poly, colleague of David's, and I am responsible for um, the productivity and collaboration of our workforce. Thank you, Kimberly. Jim? Thanks, Dave. My uh, name's Tim Floyd. I work for Verizon, where I'm a senior manager of mobility. Uh, my responsibility is effectively to manage every single mobile device for every business line and knowledge worker at Verizon. Thank you very much. Gary? Thank you, David. Uh, my name's Gary Lasasso. I'm the Director of Collaboration Experiences and Technologies and Amicus Therapeutics. We're a biotech company researching treatments and cures for very rare diseases. Thanks for having me today. Thanks a lot. And finally, Evan, say hi. How are you doing? My name is Evan Scott Smith. I design and engineer multimedia projects for Morgan Stanley in North America, and I'm a colleague of Nancy's. Well, thank you all very much for joining, and uh, and I do appreciate you taking the time because it's not you know you didn't have to do this, and it's really it's very appreciated that we hear about this. So 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 my big question right now, and anybody who wants to answer this can speak up before I start calling you out, um, is is how are you handling this, man? All of a sudden you flip a switch and every one of your workers are now mobile and home and remote. Um, it, it, how's it turning out? How's it working? <clears throat> David, so Dave, I can. I can answer from a Morgan Stanley standpoint. Um, right now, I think um, the CEO had said we have about 70,000 Morgan Stanley employees working remotely globally at this point. Um, it's been a change for everybody, but I think in overall that uh, we were equipped for it. Uh, the back end is supporting it pretty nicely. Um, everybody... Everybody's equipped with some tool, maybe not all the same tools as everybody has, but everybody has a tool or multiple tools to get through this. Um, and generally speaking, I don't want to say we're business as usual because that's, uh, that's kind of under scaling it a little bit, but we're going about as if business as usual. So, um, you know, Evan, unless you have any different feeling, I think it's worked pretty well. Um, you know, there's there's a few latencies, which everybody's having that issue. Um, you know, people late getting onto the calls because of their their individual bandwidth. But overall, I think people are, are pretty content with being able to uh, conduct business. Yeah, I think you so, so if I can see... add. Go, go ahead, uh, Evan, and then and then uh, Jim and then Gary. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, you know, if you zoom out like super macro. 
um, you know, everyone that wanted to work from home, you got your wish. How are you liking it? Um, and, you know, like for me, work was always something that, you know, I go to work was some place I always went to. Um, now I'm not really going to that place. So it's, it's an adjustment. I prefer going to work than working from home personally. Okay, Jim, you had something you wanted to add? Yeah, I mean, from my particular role, there's been very little impact, which is actually surprising. Uh, but that's because the vast, vast majority of rising employees already have a very robust mobile experience available to them. You know, we, we use the G Suite environment. We have all the Google apps that are on that, uh, and everything else that is sort of parrots what's on our desktops. Um, I will say though. Uh, Verizon has been very, uh, in the past, amenable to work from home, but hasn't really been part of the culture, and they've really had to step up and ramp up to get a lot of the back end and systems, the Citrix based systems, to get people on board for their work from home experience, which has been interesting, but they did it very quickly and fairly successfully. Good to hear. Gary, you wanted to add something there? Sure. Uh, I know, Dave, you've been a proponent of getting the voice of our end users in a, um, and we've always done that. Um, and one of the interesting things about an hour ago, I got an email uh, from one of our colleagues um, and he said, as I continue to hear from non-amicus colleagues how difficult connectivity is for them right now, it's worth mentioning how smooth this transition has been as an amicuser. These things don't happen by accident, truly appreciate it. So while I'm not sure if amicuser is a real word, um, I, I um, his sentiment is, you know, we've hear, we're hearing that a lot from our end users that, uh, and, and he's right, it wasn't by accident. Uh, our entire IT team spent, you know, a lot of time uh, on our network, um, on our collaboration tools, rolling out um, collaboration tools, Microsoft 365, et cetera, and BlueJeans. Um, and I think it's been that planning. We didn't realize we were planning for this. Um, and we didn't realize this was the crisis management and disaster recovery we were planning for, but uh, it's it's worked. Um, and from a tech, you know, from a tech perspective, I think from our, you know, sitting as an IT person, um, you know, we've been mostly in the cloud. Um, everyone has laptops. Everyone has collaboration software uh, enabled on their laptops. Um, and, and we've we've already done the adoption, so that's been a big plus. Um, there have been certainly been pockets of of issues, and that's you know, and, and that's going to be the case no matter what. Um, but yeah, and I think we've maintained a connected workforce too with all of the tools. We've been able to um, connect with each other, you know, as well as connect with our patients. And for us, that's our mission to connect with our patients. And so we've been able to do that because of all these collaboration tools. Well, that's great to hear, Pete. Let me give everybody a shot at this. You want you want to give us your thoughts as to what your yeah. interns been experiencing? So I could tell you uh, my role is uh, overseeing a group of on-site support technicians who both do live event support and in-room operational fixes and things of conference rooms. That has um, been very interesting to try to figure out how you keep everybody busy working from home when their normal job is to go to conference rooms and fix them. So we've been actually working a lot with cleaning up um, a lot of our resources and tools that we use, um, web pages that have you know inaccurate data on them, um, spreadsheets that don't have accurate counts on them, those kinds of things we've been working a lot on internally. As a company, we've made a very large um, move to everyone being from home, which has pretty much stretched, I think, a lot of the backbone of our company, right? So how do we do communications? Everyone knows Zoom and BlueJeans and other companies are running at two, three times their normal capacity. How does that affect your normal daily um, conference room calls, and, or not conference room calls, but conference calls? and and uh, how do you support that? So we actually had to remodel how our support level works as a remote model for the temporary time being, which was actually um, a pretty big lift, but we did it in a relatively short period of time. Okay, Kimberly, what's uh, what are your experiences been? Yeah, you know, I, I agree with a lot of what Gary said and, and that resonates with me and I feel like, um, you know, we're here at Poly, very advantageous position kind of coming into this because we were very well prepared in terms of uh, the products that we, 
you know, that we have, as well as our culture. Um, about eight or nine years ago, when I first joined Poly, we embarked on this mission that at the time we called Smarter Working, but it was, um, it was about enabling our workforce to be more flexible in where and how they worked. So at that time, you know, we started ramping up not only on, um, you know, our culture, as well as the tools and the technologies to support that culture. Uh, you know, for years, we've no longer been buying desktops for our employees. It's always been laptops. We've been ramping up our networks and our VPN technology, um, all with the goal of enabling a remote workforce, which uh, a great deal of our workforce was already remote even before this. So I feel like we were very well equipped for this, um, again, products-wise as well as culture-wise. So it hasn't been a, a huge shift for us. Um, like Gary said, you know, there are some exceptions to this and we're, you know, we're managing around those exceptions as well. Okay, good to hear. And Mark, let's give you the last word on that question. How are you doing? I feel like I should talk about my wife. She, uh, her company implemented Teams faster than mine did. She works for a fashion company of about 150 people, um, which really made me very jealous. But uh, Swiss Re, we're doing really well. Uh, we already had a laptop culture. Um, we have a BCM nightly requirement to bring our laptops home. We have a great VPN infrastructure. Um, we have a workplace policy called uh, Own the Way You Work. So we actually encourage people to work uh, uh, the hours and locations that's uh, convenient for them and their lifestyle. Um, we even uh, rolled out Teams this week. Happened to be the week we rolled it out for, um, for the entire company. And everything seems to be uh, spot on. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad about that. So you rolled out Teams after everybody had been working from home um, or, yeah, or we, just before? We had been Skype for a while, and uh, the enterprise folks on here certainly understand this. Um, when you start rolling and getting ready for your next platform, you know, the old platform doesn't necessarily uh, uh, get all the attention. And um, there might have been a push to roll it out early because of this. I'm not really sure on that. Um, but uh, it was pushed to all, um, all laptops over the weekend. And uh, some of the users are still using Skype because that's what they're familiar with. But I think more and more people are dipping their toe into the water. Um, I had some calls with uh, corporate real estate today, and they were excited to try it for the first time. Um, so it's been, it's been going really well. It's to, to me, someone who works from home a few days a week, um, I don't notice a difference other than my wife bugging me for IT support. Oh yeah, hey, Mark. being the home IT support is definitely uh, one of the things that uh, that's taking a lot of my time. Go ahead, Kimberly. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on that, Mark. That's that's really interesting and great to hear. Uh, before this happened, we at Poly, all our users already had Teams and were using it um, in some fashion or another, uh, but we were on a, a project and a goal to disable all of our legacy Skype environment and get everybody fully cut over to Teams. So it's only Teams and disabling that, that Skype piece. When this happened, you know, we had a lot of questions, you know, oh, is this the right time to be doing this? Should we really be continuing with this migration? And, you know, we talked it through and thought, yeah, there's no better time than this time to be doing this and making sure that, you know, we're all on the same collaboration platform, that we're, you know, we're synchronized in how we communicate and collaborate with each other. And so we've been pushing forward and we're getting great feedback from all of our users and the migration has been going great uh, despite, you know, despite everybody being remote. Stephanie, so you have anything for everybody? Along those lines, I mean, we have many of us out there, especially if you think about small and mid-sized businesses, you know, we rely on our um, home internet a lot. I mean, I've been working from home for 18 plus years. So I'm curious um, from you guys, you know, you think about, all of the families that are now at home and they're homeschooling and, you know, they're logging online for that. And then they also have multiple family members on their home network. Are you seeing any opportunities or anything that you would do different to help improve the connectivity for your at home workers? Or is there something that changes there because we are relying more on our home internet or our home Wi-Fi for services. How does that, how do you look at that? Is that something that you think about now that this whole dynamic has changed? I'll start. Um, I've already advised uh, several friends of mine to uh, get rid of their old home uh, routers at the cable companies are giving them and get a mesh network 
type of router. I use the Google Google one. I love it. Uh, the other thing I've, I've, I've asked people to do is download an app called, um, it's only available on Android. It's called Wi-Fi Analyzer. You can find out who's on the same channel you are and see who's stomping on your channel. On, it might be your neighbors and everything else. So, you know, right now I haven't noticed any degradation of my internet speed over the last two weeks. And I've been checking daily, but I, I do look at these this Wi-Fi analyzer, I've seen the vast majority of my neighbors are all in the same area, so I've shifted away in order to get better coverage. Um, but more, I think the, 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 the moral of the story is that people are going to start becoming a little more tech savvy as to how their networks are running at home now because they need it more than they ever did before. You know, it's interesting. I, I want to keep the topic going. I am actually even noticing some chop from some of you guys on the par participating in the call, which I'm certainly going to be, you know, amenable with because we're all pounding home <laughs> bandwidth. But I, I did forget to get Mike Duda involved in the last round. So, uh, Mike, you want to try and answer uh, answer this question about how, uh, how how working from home has been from you and how it's been reacting and what you've noticed with the home Internet? Yeah, sure. I think I, I, I'll... I'll add more to the initial question you asked about the general culture of working from home and like how that has been um, in general. And I, I think I have a lot less to say, frankly, around the bandwidth thing because it actually hasn't really been a concern with thanks to Fios. Thank you, Jim. Um, but um, I think, you know, it's interesting. We have about 270,000 people working at Google um, and our culture has already kind of been that it's okay. I mean, very similar to what Mark was saying, right? Um, to own the hours that you work, to own your, your work, um, and to prioritize however you need to in order to get your job done. Um, what I think is interesting with the current scenarios, you know, there's an extra layer that I think many people didn't recognize was going to be a factor, which was, you know, for any of us who have kids at home, um, the, or any of us who now have to play caretaker in general, not just to kids, but maybe to elderly ones, um, that eats into your time, right, um, that you have during the business day. And I think what what's interesting here is um, to how how have expectations have changed for employers, right? To understand that there's an extra workload here for the the users, the the employees, um, and so how can all of that work out balance wise um, for to to you know continue business as usual, but also give people the flexibility that they need um, to to take care of their loved ones uh, during a challenging time like this. And I think um, you know. I, I'm fortunate in that our company has really kind of taken a very clear mandate on that and said, you know, take care of your family first. Work will be there. Um, we'll, we'll we'll figure it out together. Um, and if you need to take time off to to do that, please do. Um, but I wish, you know, frankly, I wish that was the case more everywhere. Um, I, I see a lot of the companies that are probably on the small to to mid size range um, not being able to really afford that type of flexibility. Um, and so. You know, just kind of recognizing that I think uh, goes a long way. Thank you, Mike. And and uh, getting back to Jim, what you were talking about the uh, the idea of of the connectivity and and what people are experiencing. I'm also a very satisfied home FiOS user as well. So kudos for you on that one. Um, I have noticed though that that it's be if if we start to let people work from home as we have to now. If and when we get, you know, when we get to the end of this pandemic situation, we're going to find ourselves with people saying, you know, I think this really worked. So our company's now going to have to pay for home internet because it's an expectation to be there for uh, for disaster recovery. And if the companies are going to have to pay for home internet, are they going to keep offices as big? So Gary, I know you were itching to, to reply to when Jim started talking, but I think it's a great question that Stephanie raises: is how is this whole thing going to turn out once we get out the other end of this? Yeah, that that <laughs> it's a great question. I wish I had I wish I had the perfect answer for you. Um, I, I will I will say this: it's actually a, a question for Jim or, or continuing that conversation. You mentioned you know you're using a mesh router and swapping out your router. Um, I have a hard enough time getting people to use headsets in video calls. You know, getting them to switch out equipment is going to be a challenge. And and I agree there are some best practices. And we were just talking about this earlier in an IT staff meeting about you know, what are the things that we can do uh, that we haven't done already, you know, to give people, you know, best practices or lists or things that you, you should do. We are noticing that some of the problems or most of the problems that are happening on video calls 
are that, you know, that quote unquote last mile um, and, and connection to the homes and for whatever reasons, um, you know, so, you know, and then sort of going, going back to your, your specific question, David, I, I think it will absolutely impact um, real estate decisions and facilities decisions. Um, you know, we're looking at, you know, we're five years into conference rooms and we're looking at what we're going to do with our conference rooms, you know, over the next 12 months. Um, this is definitely um, changing some of my thinking, um, you know, and, and kind of, you know, people, all of a sudden bring your own device is pretty easy now. Um, you know, so, you know, maybe it maybe it should be in more conference rooms, um, you know, as, as one example. Um, but yeah, it definitely will. And then we're, we're actually in the process now of uh, our facilities group about looking at real estate. And I'm certain that it's going to have an impact on, you know, the size of this, the type of space and size of space that we need going forward. Yeah, so Morgan Stanley started this probably uh, about three years ago. I guess I've been there too. So yeah, three years ago. And, you know, they are making, and I want to say agile, and I put that in quotes because it's not actually agile. It's it's flexible, and we're doing a lot more hoteling now, um, and that's really just a cut down on the real estate that they're buying and leasing. Um, so Morgan Stanley had started to adapt people working from home because of that. They were hoteling. They were, you know, work from home three days a week, two days a week. So I, I think that has helped in this. Um, you know, it, we weren't there yet. We're still continuing doing that, um, but we weren't there yet that everybody had had that uh, capability. But I do think that that did help um, because a majority of the people, especially in the New York area, had started to to maybe pick up the the work from home. Obviously, not four weeks in a row, but <laughs> you know, just. I definitely think, Dave, I think this will definitely impact, you know, even where we go with stuff. Um, you know, we have started cutting down our real estate over the last couple of years and consolidating all our locations for that reason. But I actually think it will it may impact it just, you know, a little bit more based, based on the fact that they realize 70,000 people are working from home and it's okay. We're getting our business done. Anyone else? Yeah, I mean, yeah, Dave, I'll, I'll sort of add a little more. I, I think this is going to be. My wife and I were talking about it last night. And she she mentioned the, the term Darwinism. I think really that's what's going to happen with a lot of companies. It reminds me of um, when and I'll use this as an analogy. You know, before Columbus proved the world, you know, didn't just drop off at the edge of the ocean. You know, every science and every political and, and religious leader all said that you know no no one believed the Earth was round, and then it was round all of a sudden. I think you're going to see a lot of business leaders who have denied this to their employees or denied this was cap capable for their business that are now going to have to capitulate and state that this is the obvious direction for them, potentially. Well, it's going to require new training, isn't it? Isn't it going to require that uh, that we teach managers how to manage other than making sure their people are showing up on time and leaving on time? It's going to require managing by, uh, I mean, I, my company, you know, Polly is terrific when it comes to this. We're, we're always on flex time. We just do whatever we need to do whenever we need to do it. And as long as what we're supposed to accomplish gets done, nobody cares about anything. They treat us like adults and that's fabulous. And you get some of that um, at, at a lot of the Silicon Valley companies, but it's starting to move forward um, into, you know, general business in that, you know, you need a different kind of workforce to manage your remote uh, staff. And, and like many of us have said on this call, I've been doing this, you know, for more than 20 years and I have no problem with it. It's not for everybody. Some people prefer the intimacy, but it's going to require a lot of additional training, not just technology. Agreed. I, I, I call it time shifting. I mean, I, to me, I, I've told my teams for years, and I've been doing this, I've been working home steadily now for seven years and probably 10 off and on at least. But I've, I've always said, you know, the job is due at a certain date and time. I don't care when you do it. Right? And and you're right. Treat the treat your staff like adults and have as many meetings as you can and with video if you can to, to create that intimacy. But effectively, I think this is going to be the new normal for a lot of companies. And, and you are right. People are going to learn how to manage in these scenarios. And, and it's, I think it's our job and our responsibility, and we can also do a lot of good for our business and, our, and what we do to help train those people. 
not to give a shout out to you, Dave, but personally, you published something on Twitter, your your guide to working from home, and I sent that to our folks here at Verizon to use in our literature to help use for ideas. I mean, you've been doing it for a long time. I thought it was a good idea for them. Yeah, and, and personally, what gets to me is that, you know, I've been advocating remote working for close to, you know, uh, 15, 20 years at this point, and all the publications, the business publications that have been saying, no, it won't work, no, it can't work, no, it's terrible, everybody's lazy, everybody's going to be sleeping. Now, all of a sudden, they have their experts talking about how to work from home. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting. Not, the world was never around until it is. Exactly. Stephanie, again, over to you. Any, any uh, other questions from you? No, I would agree. I'd say it's quite the opposite. Um, you know, since I've started working from home 18 plus years ago, I feel like I work more hours during the week. So I put a lot more into it. And it's almost like my work, um, email, text, whatever, is that any communications that are coming in, it's almost like I work 24 seven. As long as I'm awake, I'm going to be responding to those emails and getting back to folks. You know, there are times that I turn it off and there are times that I don't. But I think it is interesting what you said, Jim, about how we may see kind of an eye opening for a lot of companies who have been putting this off for a very long time and have been so focused on corporate liable, um, you know, very stringent policies and, you know, really keeping an eye on their employees where they see, hey, this is happening and, it, and we can do this and it's working quite well. Why do we not give our employees the tools that they need. In, in many cases, it might just be we, we need better tools or more improved tools and maybe improving our security requirements. So I think the um, there is some light at the end of all of this, and that might be that we're going to find a new way of work for many companies that haven't done this in the past. So I love that perspective. Um, I wanted to ask you guys about, you know, I think that David and I talked to yesterday about uh, or a few days ago about uh, talking to all of you. I want to know if there if there have been any surprises or anything that has happened since we've kind of gone into this lockdown mode that you were surprised about or that kind of caught your eye or have given you kind of an alarm or something that you're going to change within your organization, especially when you get back to working in your offices. Anything. Hey, Stephanie, this is Kimberly. I can... Uh... I actually do have one thing exactly related to that. Um, I manage our global service desk, um, all of the folks who support our end users. And in the past, we've always talked about, you know, how we structure our service desk and, oh, we have to be able to support um, our users in person, live, what we call the walk-up experience, where somebody will take their, their laptop and come to the service desk and say, help me with this. And we've always thought we absolutely need to be able to have that experience for our end users. Well. Now we don't have a walk-up experience. We can't have a walk-up experience, right? All of our users are, are at home and all of my service desk folks are working from home supporting those users. And the eye-opener for me has been that our service has not faltered at all. We have been able to support all of our users. Our SLAs have not dropped. Um, so this signals to me, you know, we don't necessarily need to always be thinking about how we support that walk-up experience. We can maybe structure our service desk a little bit differently and be able to utilize our staff in, in better, more effective ways than just being available and waiting for somebody to walk up and, and you know, hand them the laptop. So um, I'm, I've been thinking about this a lot, and I think the time to enact this change and, and make some um, uh, you know, adjustments in that walk-up experience is, is as soon as we get back to the office um, while people are sort of already in this mode that they don't need to see our service desk folks in person. So uh, anyway, that's been one of my big eye-openers with this. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Uh, very, good very, to yeah, uh, this is Gary. Very, very similarly, um, I think um, we've learned, and it's actually, for us, it's been a little bit different in our international colleagues, our, our XUS versus our US. We, we found, uh, because we've had a lot of work, uh, you know, remote workers in our, in our international offices, so they've adapted from day one. Um, I think locally in the US, um, I've been somewhat surprised and echoing what Kimberly says, our, our you know, because we don't have a service desk um, that people can walk up to, uh, people have actually done a very decent job of kind of figuring stuff out on their own. Um, you know, when, when they've used IT as a and service desk as a crutch, they're not necessarily um, doing that anymore. Um, one, of, one of the other things uh, also as a surprise for us, um, at least for me, has been in the first few days sort of the managing of, of the work-life balance. 
um, and you know, really, I mean, everybody just because of all the tools that we have, you know, where people are 24/7. So somebody gets an idea, 10 o'clock at night, they email somebody or text somebody, and now people are responding. Um, we've had to sort of dial that down and place a bigger, a better value on our downtime uh, and our family time. Um, and our senior leadership uh, noticed that actually. And beginning next Monday, they've instituted a mandatory 12 to 1. No one can do any work. Um, we all have to spend time with our families, have lunch with our families, take a walk with our families, whatever that may be. Um, so because we're not really good at setting limits for ourselves, our senior leadership had to sort of set limits for us. Um, and, and I think that was really a, really a good thing. We've also uh, made our video conferencing platform uh, available uh, for off hours for people to use for conversations with family and friends. So that's been able to keep the connection uh, as well. So, um, yeah, so that's, I think they're the things that have surprised us. Anyone else? I'm sure there have been other surprises, Stephanie. I just think that we've got a couple of shy <laughs> people on the call. So, sorry, I, I, was, I was speaking. I, had, I was on mute. My apologies. No uh, so, so the biggest surprise we had at Verizon, at least that I've seen, is we have 1,600 stores that we directly control with 23,000 mobile devices in them. And over two-thirds of those are now shuttered until the near future. So th this is a huge revenue generation uh, area for Verizon. And I think the biggest surprise is that uh, those areas, those stores are sacrosanct with respect to the technology that was within them and how it was used and what you could and could not do. And the consideration they were now potentially moving these to people's homes to be able to do sales directly out of their homes is going to really change our landscape in the future, I believe, because they're going to find, I think they're going to see that a second opportunity, a second revenue source potentially, not just the story, but potentially people doing this from home as well. Uh, so I see, I see a bright future with that. I'm just curious as to if they will allow it. Interesting. Pete, what about from your perspective? Anything that's uh, surprising you from the technology side or from the people side? Um, no. We're, we're all set up for, for being able to support people remotely. That's why we're going to design we're going to. So I'm not on the IT side. I'm sure our desktop folks are probably freaking out. Um, but as far as the AV is concerned, uh, we're not surprised by any of this. It's actually it, it actually changed our business model, so it's a little bit surprising in that matter that we could do more than we thought we could from home um, and remotely. We can do more support than we, we have. It's also forced our customers to accept some of that kind of support. A lot of times we deal with a lot of EAs and they, they, are, they really want things a certain way and they want you in the room to help them make the thing go. And when you can't go and you're at, at your desk and they're at their desk and you're helping them remotely, it does make, make people realize, oh, we can do some of this in a different manner. But for the most part, this is kind of business as usual, but in a different way. So it's not really surprising. Good. Pete, I, Pete, I have a question for you. Yeah. So, and, and maybe this might apply to others. So I, I think about the use of video in dealing with customer issues or even, you know, Jim, you think about the um, sell, you know, online sales or person to person sales. We, you know, with, when it comes to video, you know, the only way we can really show something is to use our mobile device to be able to walk and, and go grab that video content. Um, you know, so I think about the customer experience, the digital experience uh, as we're dealing with customer calls and um, that whole experience and either selling something or fixing something or troubleshooting something. I'm wondering if since we do have a lot of folks at home that are doing quite a few activities that they normally wouldn't do, um, or they would do face-to-face, -face, if that changes things, or has anyone experienced anything new within their own organizations where that might be an opportunity to maybe make some improvements with just the mobile ap applications or the mobile interface? So what's interesting is our company is almost 100% video enabled. So we have been doing video conferencing for every call that we've ever done for probably the last year and a half or so it used to not be that way they've made a culture change before i got here um and because it's so heavily video intensive it's not like anything new so we're not we we aren't doing anything differently in the, in the way that we're communicating um we don't do anything with troubleshooting things like 
we don't have people uh, with home video conferencing systems except for you know an all-in-one kind of a system. So if it, if it would be different if we had to go into a conference room and like use a camera to kind of like look around and see what's going on physically in the room. But in this case, everyone's using their laptop. We're not responsible for laptops. We're not even responsible for the software on the back end. We're really only responsible for supporting live events and um, helping conference rooms work. And right now, that's not happening. No, that makes sense. Mike, how are things going uh, over at uh, at the Google Homestead? You guys can generally work from anywhere all the time anyway. Are you uh, experiencing anything like that? No, I mean, I think the, the biggest surprise sort of has been how quickly we're able to mobilize our um, fairly large TVC workforce um, to allow them to be able to work from home. So, you know, prior to this, all full-time employees could work from wherever, anytime, anywhere. Uh, but with TVCs, it was a little different where we would essentially not have them have access to certain resources after hours or when they're out of office. So um, it seemed like for us? Uh, so contractors. Contractors. Yep. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, seemingly overnight that that sort of changed, right? And and everybody got access to everything that they needed to do their core job all at once, um, really without seeming to miss a beat. And it, I think it kind of spoke a lot to kind of how how well we could have kept up our morale during a challenging time like we're all facing now. Um, you know, we were all able to continue working, to continue doing what we would normally do without really, you know, any inconveniences. Terrific. Mark, you also speak to a lot of people in your overseas facilities. You have, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, people all around the world, and I think your corporate headquarters is is not in the U.S. where you're located. Has the dynamic changed? One of the things that I notice in dealing with these kind of crises is they become humanizing. So instead of just rote calls taking place, you now start to get a little bit of personality into the calls and start feeling like, you know, people are, you know, dealing, especially in a global pandemic, with what you're dealing with. Any changes for you or, or, or just normal business? How's that working out with, with all the various global sites? I think the first five minutes of every call now, um, and this probably isn't limited to just global calls, everyone's checking to see how things are going in the, everyone else's backyard. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if that if that's, I mean, that's kind of a simple answer. Um, and globally, it's hitting everyone a little bit different, and I think that's, that's probably our prime concern. Um, but yeah, that's hope that answers the question. Sure, absolutely. Um, so, so uh, an, another question for me. Let's look at when we're done with this. Let's look at now. You know, we we've we we obviously you know the jokes were you know 30 days has September, April, June, and November. All the rest have 31 except March, which has 197. That's been going around the internet for the last few uh, days, at least if not weeks. Um, you know, March ended. We're now in April. We've pretty much lost April. Most of the parts of the globe now are, are looking at being locked down at least through April, and we may be getting into May. So, you know, depending upon how this goes, this could be a real extended period of time. Once we get out of it and you get back to whatever normal is for whatever companies have survived and how, what format they've survived in, are we going to plan anything differently or do anything differently? Have we started those conversations or have you started to think about some of those conversations about, <clears throat> hey, it might be nice if everybody has X, Y, Z, or if we've put in some training for this or any new thoughts around any of that? Yeah, I, I'd like to speak to that. Um, I referenced my wife earlier um, and, and uh, Peter said something as well. Um, People are adopting this home technology, and for us, we were always heavy on Skype um, without cameras. I think people were afraid to use their cameras. And what I'm expecting to see now, I don't have a crystal ball, but as we turn the corner, we get back to the office, people are gonna be more acceptable to using video. And referencing my wife, the average user is gonna realize they can do it without any help. I think that touches on what Peter said. They're not going to be so dependent, and I think this will really uh, push the uh, the video industry, and, and not just what we're doing here with laptops and and web cameras, but I think it will also um, uh, push a lot more real estate video rooms, you know, hard rooms uh, utilization up. I think this is going to be a major culture change for 
the enterprise environment. And for those who, uh, like me, I probably prefer to have my camera off most of the time, um, it's it's going to change that. I think a lot of more a lot more people will turn the cameras on. And yeah, not I agree, expect Mark. and not expect help to do it. I agree. I also think that while we're all sort of on lockdown and sort of unable to hang out with our friends and family um, in person, it's sort of forcing, right, that hand of, of having people adopt naturally the collaboration technology that we all do for work that we're all familiar with. But now, you know, I talk to all of my friends and they're like, hey, can we do a call on Facebook Messenger? Can we do a call on Hangouts or Zoom or whatever? Um, and it's becoming part of that regular user journey, right, for, for friendships, where we're having to start adopting that. Um, for, for our just everyday social existence. And I hope that as we kind of exit out of this COVID world, um, that some of the lessons learned from that will kind of start taking shape into what we do at work as well, right? And not have people, to Mark's point, be afraid of using a video camera. Like, I think those days should be kind of behind us, hopefully. Yeah, the great advantage of this horrible situation <clears throat> is I can now tell people what I do for a living. All the stuff that you're doing, that's what I do for a living. That's what I've always I, been doing. Now you get it. I've been thinking about that too. You know, my <laughs> kids are the first generation who understand what I do now. My parents would never understand it. But, um, you know, my five-year-olds, oh, daddy sets up the camera for my karate class over Zoom. Is, well, is well I don't know if you guys – oh, go ahead, Evan. Uh, is there a devil's advocate role to be played here? Absolutely. The, the, I'm sure you'll do it if if there is. <laughs> no, 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 please here, Evan. Go for it. Tell us we're wrong. No, I I don't think that you're wrong. And I, I but talking, you know, based off of like what Mike said, um, you know, Mike and I have worked together, and Mike and I are also socially friends. And we've been talking about you know grabbing a drink for a while. Does this interaction, now that we've actually seen each other face to face, actually prolong that, you know, that human interaction of us actually getting together physically? And, and it, you know, I, I think, look, I think that in some ways this is great to be able to, you know, connect with others in the industry or connect with people on my team or people within my organization. I, I still personally, and this is odd because I may be the youngest of the bunch. I still feel that this is not my primary, would be my go-to choice of interacting. It would be my primary mode of communication either. I'm not sure it, it, it I don't, I'm not sure they're saying it would be the primary, Evan. Um, I, I know, and I've told you this since we chat every day, you know, yesterday I had a, uh, a Zoom call with, um, you know, 12 of my college friends. Now, they live all over the country, and to be honest, we're like, why didn't we do this before? We only see each other once every couple of years or whatever, and we had the best time, and we each bought a cocktail and, you know, the virtual cocktail hour. Will we continue doing this after this nightmare is over? Probably, only because we don't have the opportunity to go out and, and see each other. And, you know, you and Mike can meet in the city and have a drink. True. Um, and you know, this so, is why I love working with Nancy. She is the she devil's advocate to my devil's advocate. <laughs> well, I can't, I was going to add too that this might be one of the best um, training fields that we've had in this space because I, I, I can name 20 people that I know that have never even turned on a video cam or Zoom or right. Blue Jeans or micro teams that are now working it like a champ. So I think that there's probably some pretty powerful stuff there that we've got a whole group of end users that have never used this technology that are using it and it's easy for them and it's not perfect, but they, they know how to use it and they may be more comfortable using it in work environments and other purposes now than they have in the past. So, I mean, I know so many schools and colleges that have, they're not online or web-based and they just don't really use that, you know, especially some of the private schools and now they're, of course, completely online learning platforms. So. Things are changing, and I think that it's definitely going to create a whole new end user base of knowledge workers that have never had this before. So it's it's I think that that piece is pretty powerful. I think yeah, that, Stephanie, yeah. it was is interesting because it's a blog that I'm actually got triggered to write today. If you turn on any late night TV or any news shows or anything else, all of these things that we've been complaining are not good enough quality video because sometimes they chop or sometimes the audio is a little echoey. Well, all these things that were actually just red herrings because 
it's okay for us. We're fine. I mean, there, there, we've, we've obviously been suffering some bandwidth issues on this call. If you watch the video of it, you'll see occasionally somebody was freezing or something was happening. But you know what? For the most part, it was fine. And we know that that's because the, the home internet and the broadbands are being pounded. I don't know if you can hear my wife up there screeching. She's doing early intervention with young kids in, in the New Jersey area over video for the first time now. She, she's using a poly studio. She's got the best camera of anyone on her team. But 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 she's still, you know, we're, we're both pounding the internet at the same time time i think you're just going to see more and more people accepting the fact that this is what this technology does now now to go back kimberly to, to, to what you were saying before you know around this concept of smarter working that i was all in on and it really evan addresses your point this isn't going to change my lifestyle as a remote worker in any way once it's over i need to be where i need to be if I need to be in a meeting with people because I have to look at a site or, or inspect equipment or present at a conference, I'm going to be there. If I have to meet at a client's office in, in a city, you know, a train right away or an airplane right away, I'm still going to go. But my option from being smarter and smarter working and working from home is that my daily commute is down four steps into my office in my basement. So, so I, the, even if we get 10, 20% of the people adopting that going forward, where I'm not going to travel to a physical place just to sit in front of a computer because I've got the screens at home, even if it's just that small, it's still going to be a major change as to how we, we do with things. I mean, are you hearing that as well, guys? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I don't think, you know, at least for us, I don't think we're going to be looking to shed real estate um, because I think we'll still need a lot of it. Um, and I think at a certain point, there will be still that desire for, for business as usual to, to actually be in the office, to have those water cooler conversations, to bump into people. You know, I think that's 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 healthy social human interaction, right? Um, I think what this does is it just validates the fact that this is another alternative where that's not possible, right? If I can't be in the office for whatever reason, whether it be private or, or, or whether I just literally can't be there because I'm in a different city, um, the idea to be able to connect through cameras and microphones, you know, it, it's the second best thing, in my opinion, right? If I can't hang out with Gary in person, we can do this, right? So um, I think it's just, a, it's a viable alternative. It's better than a phone, right? Because I can see Gary, I can see what he doesn't like what I'm saying because he'll, he'll look a certain way. Um, <laughs> or <I> can... <laughs> Uh, but in general, right, like it, it just gives you more visual cues. It gives you more auditory cues. I'm, I'm able to have more of a real conversation. Um, and we're using webcams now, Mike, in the way that they're intended. Remember, the, the, going back in our industry, the Danto arm test, the, if you can touch the web camera, then, then you're actually at the right distance. We're these, these beautiful head and shoulder shots. We can see emotions. We can see if we're reaching people. You know, when we go back to these conference rooms that we're building, if the cameras you're putting in are not able to make these really good, I can see your face shots, people right. are going to start to say, oh, this isn't as good as what we had at home. So the conference rooms, gonna, the camera technology in the conference rooms going to have to come up to speed. A lot of it on the market is. Yeah, so 100%. does the interface. So does the interface. So if you are able to control the layout of the screen where you put the content and you can see a list of the people joining and your room can't quite do all that, that's going to also affect um, my job, actually. Sure. Expectations change. And David, I was just curious, you know, one thing we haven't actually, haven't actually talked about were the tools that we're using. Obviously, you know, we're on blue jeans for this call, but I I would imagine that some of us, and probably Mike could speak to this, is like he's in a fully integrated, you know, G Suite stack. Whereas, like, we just rolled out Teams this week, actually, as well. So we use Skype internally for certain things. They want to, you know, we're going to start piloting Teams, and then we uh, we use Zoom um, for, you know, our our external video conferences, where Zoom actually happens to work better on our personal laptops on our home network than it does on our VPN client, but Skype as our VPN client works perfectly. So there's a, you know, for me, like I'm actually utilizing multiple tools at any one given time to execute quote unquote business as usual. Welcome you to take my the world. Drawing piece of it too, you can have Bluebeam or Plan Grid, you know, I mean, add multiple layers of other stuff that we may or may not use in our day to day. Yeah, and Evan, uh, Mark said earlier, you know, or or I'm sorry, 
maybe Gary, I don't remember who, said that they just rolled out Teams and that they're, they're only on one platform now. Um, you know, like you said, we have so many multiple platforms. I never know, should I be going on my laptop? Should I be VPNing into my desktop? Or should I go on my, you know, my personal? So to have one platform would, would just be so much easier. And so, you know, this way everybody would be able to just have the same experience all the time and everybody would get the training they needed on that specific platform. Yeah, I mean, like, are we the only ones that are using multiple manufacturers, multiple suites of tools, or is everyone kind of fully invested? Or no, I, I can tell you <laughs> as an expert in the industry that people are fighting this conversation continually all the time. And the, and the manufacturers and the, the platform providers will tell you that they want to interoperate, but they define interoperability in their own narrow terms. And, and, and it, it works for in the first person, our interoperability works, but theirs doesn't. Everybody's going through that. And, and there are certain tools that are better than other tools at certain jobs. For forever, I'm always going to be the guy that's saying, hey, pick the tool you need for the job. You can't pick the tool out of your tool bag until you know what job you're doing. Don't bring a hammer to cut glass. You know, there is no one universal right thing. And I use as many of them as you do all the time. In addition, I'm online with, with Twitter, with LinkedIn, with chats, with, with, uh, with email messages, personal and business. The communication bombards you. I'm glad I have a lot of computers in front of me at home. David, I think that's the lesson that uh, that that actually I've learned and we've learned at, at Amicus as an IT team. Is we, we've enabled all of these tools for people, specifically the Microsoft suite, and we do have BlueJeans and some some other video conferencing platforms. But um, the, the lesson that we've learned is we we I think we need to do a better job of communicating when what to use when, what tools to use when, because a lot of them do overlap. And that's kind of been like anytime I send out a communication, I get a you know I get an email back and and it says well well what am I supposed to use this time? When do I use this? When do I use that? And we think we're communicating it and training people on it, but I don't know if we're 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 getting everybody when we when we do that training. So I think um, you know the lesson that I'm going to take to the future is really never stop training. Never stop communicating. Um, collaborate with our comms team and our and our HR team to help um, you know to help inform our workforce on everything that's available to them and kind of what to use when. Good point. All right, so why don't we go around the horn one more time since we're running out of time here, and let's give everybody a kind of a last word on this. And I would guess probably the thing that I would want to let everybody do is what's their biggest takeaway from from this entire event? I mean, is it to have more stuff in stock? Um, is it to, to um, uh, have a better help desk or more people or less people? Or, you know, let, let's go in, uh, in, let me pull up the order that I had over here. Let's start with you, Evan. Um, what, when we come out of this thing, what's, what's your biggest takeaway from all of this? I think like, you know, for years now, as this uh, UC audiovisual environment has been evolving, we've been, you know, planning or trending towards the future. The future's here. I mean, if you, we got cut over into the future in a matter of you know days, I think that that's kind of interesting, like the the way in which we've been able to respond to it, be resolute in our work. But I also you know we're it's gonna business as usual would be different moving forward, and there's no more talk about it. It's actually here. It's an interesting moment to live in and through. We had no choice. Yeah, Gary. Yeah, so I think I think um, for for me, I think it's we don't have to give up our work life balance. We could use all of this technology and still uh, maintain that work life balance. And then um, and we can still, you know, in Amicus, this is very important to us. We can still um, use these tools and um, live our lives with empathy um, to each other and to our patients. And that's the most important thing for us. Good. Jim, what about you? What are your uh, t biggest takeaway from this? Well, I kept thinking of that, I don't know if it's an Aesop fable, but the cricket and the ant, right? We've been preparing for this, to, to, to pair what Evan said, for a very long time. We're used to it. Our time, I, I wrote down this quote before we started, our time is now. This is, this is our time to say, hey, we know how to do this. We can help you. Um, and, and the other two points I want to say is th thanks to Hurricane Sandy to prove that this could work many, many years ago here in New York. And now the rest of the world is seeing what we went through 
And then last, no last point to everyone is make sure to put on pants. Because you will stand <laughs> up someday. Okay. That's, uh, you know, one of the Sounds things like that you're was speaking in... from experience. <laughs> oh, yeah. One of the things that was in my article is you have to keep a routine, whatever that routine is. If it's waking up at a certain time, if it's getting dressed, if it's working out, you know, just because you're working from home, it's exactly the same. And that, you know, my routine, thank God, every day always includes clean clothes, pants, underwear, the whole nine yards. <laughs> uh, Kimberly, what's your, uh, what's, what's your biggest takeaway from this so far? Yeah. Um, you know, to maybe just try to summarize it, you know, despite the fact that I think we were really well prepared and situated for this, um, that doesn't mean we still don't have a little bit more to learn, a little bit more to do, uh, particularly around supporting the managers and teams who are new to this, who are really just kind of coming around to this new way of working, um, and, and helping them continue on that journey, I think, once, once this is over. Um, they're now over a hurdle, and let's help them continue with the race, I guess. Um, I think that's one takeaway and the other, you know, some people have already said it, but I feel like empathy is the biggest thing here. Um, while this works for a lot of people, it doesn't work for everybody. Um, a lot of people don't have their, their home situation uh, set up in a way that they can, you know, carve out a place to work and, and be private. And so just really kind of understanding that what wor might work for me or for you doesn't work for everybody. And we need to understand that and help those people. And you don't want to leave out that everybody needs a really good headset, right? And don't forget, really good headset, really good camera, all of that. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Kimberly. Mark, what about you? What are your biggest takeaways from this? Um, I think you really had an interesting comment about uh, bandwidth and home users. And uh, uh, that it's very astute. And um, I'm curious if my audio is dropping out for anyone at all or my video. Um, but Your that, audio has actually been very good. I don't know what headset you're wearing, but it kind of is making me think of Locutus. You know, if that, that LED comes right into the camera, it's a I just scary. noticed that when I connected because I never used my camera. I realized it's like probably blinding people. But no, um, every, every, it, th there have been some dropouts on this call with audio and video, and there have been some strain noise. But you know what? Everybody's still going to enjoy the information we put forward. So what's your takeaway? So, no, so bandwidth, I think, is good. And and. Without trying to plug anyone, I know what your answer is going to be, but you and Gary have really good camera images. So maybe I should ask Gary because I know what you have. Gary, what do you use them for a camera? Well, I, I have to admit I'm just using the camera on my uh, Lenovo laptop. I, oh, think it's the, I think it's the lighting and the staging that uh, my <laughs> wife took care of earlier today. Do you have a makeup yeah, artist there, Gary? Like the, the winner there. <laughs> well, it looks great. <laughs> They put his own lipstick stick on. I think, you know, the, the, having a really good camera at home is very important. But, you know, if I, if you're looking at me right now, if you and I, I, I did this test recently, you know, if I if I kill the lights that I've set up just for the call, you can immediately see the difference that that it's not going to be as good. So lighting and a good headset will make a big difference, especially. And also, I, again, in the video that I did, looking at the camera which makes people think you're looking in their eyes. So so th those are tricks. I have a video out that does that. If you guys want the link to it, I can send it to you. But um, it's not just the camera, it's everything. And uh, Mr. Duda, how, uh, how, what's your biggest takeaway from all this? You know, I think all of us on this call are kind of fortunate in the sense that we're able to to have these conversations. And, cause, and we do this, right? We live this reality on a, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, what I'd love to see happen after this is all over is some of the players that aren't represented here, um, not just the people in the AV field, but really people that aren't set up for AV. Again, you know, thinking about smaller companies that have never really thought that this was important, right? That that, that they, they don't have the, the, the budget for it or that it seems hard or it's not really part of our culture. Like I would love to move the needle on that and I'd love to see that start taking shape because I think we can all talk about tweaks that we could make to our individual, you know, individual businesses. But frankly, we're all kind of already there, right? We're looking to, to, to make that five or 10% of a difference. Um, I would love to see companies that haven't have, haven't had anything go from zero to something um, after this is over, because we're clearly demonstrating the importance of this. And I think, you know, companies, groups like the IMCCA can do a fantastic job educating people who maybe don't have a lot of the uh, knowledge around what you see in VCR to, to spread the word and to, to let them really understand what this world is all about and to not make them afraid of it. I think if we can do that, um, 
and combine that with the empathy that Gary and Kimberly were talking about, um, I think that's that does humanity a lot of good, right? Um, and I, I think that would be an amazing thing to see um, when and all this is over. Plus, I'd love to have that beer with Evan at some point. So, <laughs> yeah, I want to come. Yeah, all right, you're in. What's your takeaway? Whiskey, I'll come. So, you know, I, I think from Morgan Stanley's standpoint, we've been able to function, and I put this again in quotes, you know, business as usual. But, you know, the 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 empathy that I, I would hope would come, you know, we're, we're talking to our vendors every day and, you know, they're furloughing people. Um, there's no construction sites open, you know, we're losing our techs. And I just hope like when we come out of it, you know, not only are they our techs and, and our vendors, you know, a lot of them are friends and we've known them for a long time. So I just really hope that, you know, we can continue to, you know, do what we can, you know, as employing them to let them do what they can do pay them i mean i know i'm speaking because i'm not writing a check for morgan stanley but you know at the end of the day we're gonna we're gonna hear a lot of a lot of people have lost their jobs and we've already started to see that um just with some of the integrators and and you know techs and smaller companies that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis so i would like to think that maybe our industry as a whole or or can can help that and i and i don't know what that solution is and i don't know i don't know what that help looks like right now but again i i think coming out of this i think we're gonna be surprised at how the domino effect really affected the people yeah. that we work with within it's our industry devastating in so many places inside and outside so of many. our industry and and so you know, many. How, how we rebuild is going to be very difficult i wish we had prioritized in our industry what we're dealing with this technology a little more imagine if all of the auto work av integrators and technology integrators would be able to support the help desk around people that are home for the first time it, it was an mm -hmm. opportunity that we missed and we were screaming about it for years so hopefully that will change as well so all really good points. Pete, what are your takeaways from here? Well, our company has this technique they use called follow me home, and it's how they build our company where the founder would go and ask customers and observe them using our technology or our product or whatever they were trying to develop. We use that technology. We use that technique, I mean, a lot in our own inner circle. So we do our own follow me homes. We, we work with our customers a lot. I hadn't done a whole lot until this whole situation went down. So I actually sat down, met with a lot of the EAs in our in our company. There's, we have like hundreds of them. So we've been meeting with them regularly. Because of this, I learned I need to do that more because that'll help me improve our business offering, the way that they engage with us, the way they interact, open tickets, you know, get the support they need. All of that is all being redone and retooled right now because of those follow me homes that we recently did. So my my takeaway is to do that more often and regularly. Pete, thank you very much. Everybody, thank you very much. Stephanie, I'm going to come to you in a minute and give you the last word here, but I'm going to put everybody on the hook for a moment. When we see we're coming out at the light at the end of the tunnel on this one, guys, you know, when we're a few days away from being able to unlock the doors, I'm going to invite you all back. Hopefully you can make it and let's do a, what the lessons learned are when it's not just a couple of weeks, when it's been, you know, a month or two months uh, and things aren't funny anymore um, uh, to get your opinion. So hopefully you'll all join us again for that. Looking forward to it. There you go. Okay. Thanks for uh, putting this together, David. Oh, thank you guys. Really Thanks, appreciate David. it. Uh, Stephanie, uh, let me give you the last word here. What are your takeaways from all of this? Yeah, so some final thoughts. I think the big thing is, is give grace. Give grace to yourself. Give grace to your teams. Give grace to those that aren't tech savvy and that are, aren't necessarily familiar with the technology. I think that we have a lot of work to do in, in that area. I'd also say we have a great group of people on this particular session here, a lot of bigger companies, a lot of more advanced companies. So it's it's not surprising that you many of you were prepared. But I do. I, I think about the very small businesses, the ones that um, are primarily on their smartphone and they don't really use technology the way that they are now or that they need to because they're now purely at home. So. Some of those businesses make it, um, and I think about the rural communities, the ones that don't have the bandwidth that they need to do these things. So that's also a concern. And I'd say the last thing is, is for these small businesses and even for your teams at home is, is providing you guys providing tips. I, one of the things that I noticed with our with my kids' school is they created a whole new program, Heritage at Home. So many companies could create the same thing the name of your company at home and put together tips 
Um, when you are at home, these are the things that you got to be concerned with. These are the, th the tools that we have, and, and these are the ways you can connect to these different tools that we have in place. So that might, that would be more of a tips and a key takeaway. Those kinds of things have are enabling businesses and thinking more about the remote workforce more than ever. So it's great to connect with you all today, and I've learned a lot from you. I appreciate you inviting me. Okay, so thank you everybody for joining us for this webinar. We are going to absolutely keep doing them throughout this crisis at the IMCCA. Thank you to the IMCCA. Please go to our pandemic support site. I'll just go to imcca.org and pull it down on resources. Thank you very much to my colleagues at Poly for sponsoring and helping us put this one together this time. Um, until we get the next one out there, thanks very much, and we'll see you soon.